Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter number 11. We are uh, less than three weeks away from not only, at least on the Gregorian calendar, really the end of not only another month, but another year. And it always, there does always seem that once you flip another year, another calendar, uh, there's always a, a sense of something new, right? Of a, a new beginning, perhaps. I don't know. Always seems like that way. Uh, we look back at uh, the year, and uh, you kind of think back, some good times, some bad times, what have you. But uh, I think we're all in agreement. 2020 has been, uh, very challenging, at least from a, physically speaking, right? Uh, we've had to go through a lot uh, in just one year, and the year's not even over, right? Uh, we had a virus come uh, to our shores from the Far East, right? Didn't really know what all we were dealing with at the time. When it initially came, we didn't know how dangerous it was or how fatal or anything. Uh, wasn't long after that, really, we started to get like somewhat of a handle on what we were dealing with, and then all of a sudden here come all the race riots, right? And uh, many people were hurt and policemen were assaulted. Uh, businesses were ransacked and looted. Uh, a number of them uh, burned. Uh, major cities, so many of our, our cities like Minneapolis, Kenosha, others as well just devastated. It'll take perhaps decades for those cities to come back. Um, we've had to deal with, <laughs> right, lockdowns and many quarantines and uh, been uh, censorship and all the censorship, whether it be from the mainstream media or social media, uh, YouTube and uh, print media and so on and so forth, uh, so much uh, uncensorship unlike we've ever seen. And then it seems <laughs> the, the cherry on the Sunday, right? The election. And, you know, it, it certainly appears as if uh, we'll have a new president being sworn in uh, come next month. And unfortunately, uh, for the first time, really in the history of our nation, we're going to have a, a man take office that all the evidences point to that he was not elected, not by the people, not even by the elect, and really not even by the electoral college. Uh, but that's what we have, and um, you know we have to deal with what we've got. Um, I want this message, really, in the midst of all of that, to be an encouragement because there's a lot to be discouraged about. Uh, I will tell you that our nation is not dying, okay? Morally speaking, it's dead and has been dead for quite some time, morally speaking. But the nation itself, as far as America, it's not going anywhere. So it's not dying, but it's changing. That it is. It's changing. Uh, and really what I want to show you, not only from the book of Daniel this morning, but uh, from the pages of history, our adversary, his game plan never changes. It's amazing. Uh, he's using an old playbook in our country, what you're seeing, that was used over 2,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. So let's dig into this lesson and find out what's going on. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. Daniel writes, and in his place, speaking of future time, in his place, a despicable person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred. But he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this time of the year. It is uh, the Feast of Dedication, and we thank you for it. 
We thank you that we can celebrate the Festival of Lights. And Lord, I ask and pray that this lesson that we're going to take a look at, which is not only your scriptures, but what has happened in history, we can have a, a better understanding, not only of what we're dealing with, but we can also rejoice in your promises and that the light always shines in the darkness. And so we, we lift up uh, this time together with you and your word. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So we're currently right in the, towards the beginning, midst of celebrating the Festival of Lights, right? It's also known as Hanukkah. Uh, but this eight-day celebration, uh, biblically speaking, is uh, referred to as the Feast of Dedication. At least that's what the Apostle John in his Gospel calls it, chapter 10, the Feast of Dedication. So, as a launching point, and we're going to touch on a lot of points today, uh, but as a launching point, so I have this question, like a two-part question for you. Uh, when the children of Israel left Egypt, okay, what we know of as we celebrate the Passover, right, the Exodus, if you prefer. When the children of Israel left Egypt, was Israel a slave nation that was escaping from the clutches of a pagan dictator, uh, a slave nation that God would eventually bring to Sinai, give uh, his chosen the Torah, uh, a, a nation that he's going to usher in the purpose plan of God, uh, the purpose plan of God, which would include the promise of a coming Messiah, and with the coming of that Messiah, redemption for all those whom he has chosen. Or, part two, was Israel simply a slave nation escaping from an oppressive dictator that they escaped for no other reason than just to head off and establish or carve out a little piece of land that they could call their very own. Now I'll have you know that the unbelieving world that is out there, and especially the Middle East, would have you believe the latter. Okay. More often than not, people believe what they want to believe. People believe what they choose to believe. More often than not, People see what they choose to see. And so they choose what they want to believe, what they see, what they want to hear, they choose. And then what people do is they'll arrange the details, dare I say facts, to support their thesis. Okay, I've explained it to you this way. You take a dart, you throw it against the wall. You walk up to the wall, you draw the bullseye around the dart. Okay. People believe what they choose to believe. And when you think about it, even matters of the spiritual realm, matters of faith, no different. Really no different. Many people, like let's say, take for, take for instance the book of Job. Right? This is the mentality, right? The friends of Job. So if you're a bad person, you've transgressed, a sinner, God opens up heaven and thunder of lightning and wrath and anger and just bad things. But if you're a good person, you do good things, God will open up heaven and shower you with blessings and lollipops and all those other things, right? So... I mean, when you think about it that way, right? I mean, what would you choose, right? Would you be a good person or a bad person? Do you want God unleashing his anger on you? Do, or you got just, you want God to just go ahead and shower you with blessings? I mean, if you, if you bring it that way, 
It's, it's an easy choice. But biblically speaking, is that an accurate concept of God? Is that the God of the Bible? Good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and that's how God deals with it. No. No, on the, on the other hand, or I, I should say conversely, many times bad things happen to believers, and God allows these things to happen. He will allow suffering to come into our lives for a variety of purposes, Sometimes to set us straight, sometimes to prevent us from sinning, sometimes to just mold us, make us into what he needs us to be, sometimes to draw somebody that perhaps is in your family closer to him. So he will use suffering and he will use trials and, and travail and all in a variety of different ways. So every day, every single day, you and I have the opportunity when we get up, to be a blessing, not only to God, but for God. Conversely, every day we wake up and we get out of bed, we have the opportunity to absolutely destroy our own testimony. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. I have it every day. So, unfortunately, bad things happen to good people. And good people, if you want to call us that, righteous people, down throughout history, have had to suffer. Believers have had to suffer for thousands of years at the hands of the wicked. Many believers, currently in Africa, throughout Africa, believers are suffering. They're being persecuted, tortured, kidnapped imprisoned, arrested, put to death for no other reason than their faith because of the God of Israel. That's our God. And people have had to suffer for millennia. Hanukkah is a great story. It's a great memorial. Uh, one of the greatest memorials that we have on the biblical calendar. Every evening we get together, maybe it's you and your spouse or the family, we get, gather together and we light another candle. And every evening that ceremony, if you want to call it that, uh, it's a memorial, right? But every evening when we gather together, we light another candle. It's also a solemn reminder it's a reminder, it's a, it reminds us of the story, and it also reminds us that this world without Yeshua is a very dark place. It is an evil world. And so Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, is a celebration of, and a remembrance of light versus darkness. Light versus darkness. The sages and the rabbis of their days would refer to Greece or compared Greece to darkness. Darkness. Imagine that. The, the very culture that gave us the gymnasiums and philosophy and wisdom and art and sport and plays and all those kind of things, right? Darkness. There are Messianic believers. I've heard the teachings. They can't fathom. Oh, no. God would use the Greek language in order to bring about his word. They can't, they can't believe it. And so I've heard it taught. The New Testament, the Apostolic Scriptures, they were originally written in Hebrew and then translated into Greek for, quote, mass distribution. There's no evidence of that whatsoever, none. But that's the thought, is Greek, Greece, darkness. It's dirty, there's something filthy about it. And so the culture in many writings is viewed as darkness. Now, let me share with you 
darkness in a name, Antiochus Epiphanes. Now we're talking darkness, okay? Darkness. Daniel 11, verse 21. And in his place, Daniel writes, a despicable person, Antiochus, will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred, but he will come at a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. That Hebrew word, it's not used very often. It's only used four times in the Hebrew scriptures. It refers to treachery or something slippery, right? And that's exactly what happened. This leader, Daniel lets us know, is going to assume the leadership position <laughs> through treachery, some hypocrisy. Fathom that. A leader coming to the top through treachery. Who would have thought? So Antiochus IV Epiphanes, he ruled from 175 to 164 before the Common Era. He was a vile, despicable person. He took a swine and slaughtered it on the altar in the temple, Israel's temple. He took a statue, an image of Zeus, and erected it in, of all places, the most holy place. He was a despicable individual. He was a pagan worshiper. No fear of God whatsoever. Verse 31, and forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolation. They would try and force the Jewish people to offer profane sacrifices, eat, eat wine, eat pork, and these kind of things. Despicable. When, I'm trying to make some sense of this thing, when one studies history in accordance with the nation of Israel, right, and there are various exiles, okay, and let's talk about from the destruction of the first temple, Solomon's temple. You've got four major empires, right? You've got the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, the Grecian Empire, as well as the Roman Empire. And we know the first temple was destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian Empire. We know the second temple was destroyed by Titus, Roman Empire. The Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, as well as the Roman Empire. For the most part, there was no temple on the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. Again, the Romans came along, it was there, then they destroyed it. Okay, so, and, and of course the Medes and the Persians, Cyrus issues the decrees, so on and so forth. But for the most part, there was no temple on Mount Moriah. Okay, not so with the Greeks. When you think about it, not so with the Greeks. The Greeks, the Grecian Empire, had no problem with Israel's temple. Isn't that something? Had no problem with it. They had no problem with Israel's temple being on Mount Moriah. They, the, the, the people of the Acropolis, right, the Acropolis, and, and the amphitheaters, and the gymnasiums, and pagan temples. They had no problem with Israel's temple. None. And yet, we know Israel's temple, that temple in Jerusalem, was the epicenter of Jewish religion, right? The epicenter of Jewish religion. And the Greeks had no problem with it. None. It wasn't Israel's temple that infuriated the Greeks. It was Israel's Torah. The Torah, the Hebrew scriptures, that's what infuriated the Greeks. They hated the Torah. We have currently in our nation and they didn't get there by just taking over. We elected them. 
wicked politicians from the federal, state, and local level, wicked politicians. We have corporate elitists, uh, community organizers, uh, university professors, and on and on, right? Listen, they have no problem with church buildings. They have no problem with the buildings. They have a problem with the Bible that's being taught in those buildings. That's where the problem lies. Okay? So it's this allegiance, if you will. All these born-again Christians throughout these 50 states, these believers, and their stubborn allegiance to that Bible, that book, that's what infuriates the Marxists more than anything. They don't have a problem with the buildings. They could care less about the buildings. It's our allegiance to that book. That's where the problem lies. And the Greeks had no problem with Israel's temple. It was the Torah that infuriated them. Israel's stubborn allegiance to God's Torah. And it infuriated the Greeks. And so the Greeks looked at it and said, okay, well, if we can't destroy Israel from the outside, we will get inside and destroy her from the inside out. Daniel 11, verse 32. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. And Mattathias Maccabee, and we'll get a little bit more into his story in a, in a moment, he and his family, among many other Jewish people at the time, they knew exactly what the Greeks were up, were trying to do. They knew exactly what they were up to. And Mattathias and others saw the situation and they said, we're not taking this line down. We know what you're up to. You want to destroy not the nation, you want to destroy us. Change us. Change who we are. Mattathias was a father of five. He was an honorable man. He was a well-respected man. Uh, but Mattathias was a rebel. He was a rebel. And he and his family saw what was happening and said, no, 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 no. We know what you're up with. We know what you're trying to do. So to understand Israel and Greece, we have to go back, way back, to the ancestors of Israel and Greece. Okay. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, Japheth. Okay. We know about their stories, or their story, Genesis chapter 9. Okay. From Shem descended the Hebrew people, Semitic people, Hebrew people. From Japheth descended the Greeks, now, Noah blesses these two sons, Shem and Japheth. What were the blessings that he gave them? To Shem, Noah says, Blessed be the Lord, yod heh -Bav -Heh, the God of Shem. The blessing he gives Japheth, May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Okay, so from Shem, we've got Israel, the scriptures, the Torah, the temple, the Messiah. From Japheth, we get Greek philosophy, athletic events, the gymnasiums, the plays. When you look at the two blessings, what do we have? Shem, Japheth. Shem's blessing is internal. Japheth's blessing is external. I read a commentary, it was years ago, can't even remember who it was, but I jotted it down in my notes. And the commentator writes this, quote, Do you ever notice it's human nature that vastly different sorts of people, people do not find themselves in conflict unless their differences are in like matters? 
So what's he trying to say? It's like this. You, don't, you never see carpenters arguing with doctors or accountants arguing with mechanics or lawyers arguing with electricians, right? But put two lawyers together, right? Put two doctors together, two, put two professors together or whatnot. And then have them converse and have a differing of opinions on the same topic. And what will happen is the argument between the two can become so combustible that you have animosity. Now follow along in my thinking. So we got the, the offspring of Shem, Hebrew people, right? Israel, if you prefer. Then we got Japheth, Greece, Israel, God, Torah, culture, faith, Greece, the gods, philosophy, culture, wisdom. By the time you get to our story, Judaism would not bow down to Antiochus. Antiochus would not bow down to Israel's Torah. Would not submit. And so, if we cannot destroy Israel, if we cannot disgrace Israel's God from the outside, then we will destroy Israel and we will disgrace Israel's God from the inside out. What do you see happening in this country? America was founded on Judeo-Christian values. That is a fact. I don't care what the 1619 Project tries to say. It was founded on the Bible for decades. The only book in public schools in America was the Bible. Okay? Our Constitution, all right? Our, our method of economics, the, the, the capitalistic system is based on biblical principles. Everything. Everything. Okay? You cannot destroy America from the outside. It's far too superior, militarily speaking. You cannot. So what's the plan? What have the Marxists been doing now for decades? Injecting it. Injecting something, a poison, into this system. And they've been doing it for years. Socialism. And abortion. And homosexuality. And homosexual marriage. And transgenderism and race wars, and on and on, because the way you destroy it is from the inside out. It is an old playbook. It's an old playbook. Satan is using the very same playbook in our country that he used over 2,000 years ago. It's the same thing. It just looks a little different. Antiochus and the Syrian Greeks attempted to impose their will and their culture on Israel. And Mattathias knew it. They knew it. God-fearing people, those that had not become Hellenists by that time. So because some many, many of the Jewish people, they went along with it. We'll just become Hellenists. Right? We'll just blend in with the Grecian society. And then there were others that said, no way. No, we know what you're doing. You're trying to turn us into you. And so in the process, the Greeks attempted to destroy Israel's allegiance to her God. What do you see happening in our country? What are they attempting to do? You can't destroy us from the outside in. But you can destroy our allegiance to God. Listen to the words. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic 
for which it stands, one nation. That's the problem. Flies right in the face of Marxism. One nation. See, Marxism doesn't look at one nation. They don't, Marxism does not accept individualism. No, Marxism accepts globalism. So it's not one nation, it's one world. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Marxists, there is no God. There is no God. There is no creator. There is no God. Destroy this thing from the inside out. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And Marxism hates all of it. So what did the Greeks do? They defiled the temple and they chose three ordinances as their targets. Because we're gonna, we're gonna destroy this thing from the outside. We're gonna inject the poison in it and we'll take this thing down inside out. So what three ordinances did they choose? Interesting. Sabbath day, new moons, circumcision. Why those three? Well, let's go through them. Slowly. The Shabbat. What is the Sabbath day? The Sabbath day is a remembrance of the works of creation. Right? Six days he created everything. He rested on the seventh day. Okay? So the Sabbath day, every Friday evening we gather together, whether you light the candles, sip the wine, whatever. Right? It's a memorial. It's a memorial of the works of creation. Oh. Oh, well, wait a minute. If Shem's God, if Israel's God is the true creator, well, then the Greeks would have to bow down to that God. Oh, we can't have that. We can't have that. So guess what they did? Destroy the Sabbath day. Make it illegal. You could not celebrate the Sabbath day. What do you see here in our country? Close the churches. Pandemic. We're looking out for your health. Pandemic. Can't, can't go to church. You can go to Walmart all you want. Target, Costco, right? You can do all of that you want. Don't you dare go to church. We got a, we got a pandemic out there. In fact, out in California, we got a governor who said, no singing in church, no chanting in church because of the coronavirus. The very same governor that went to the fancy French Laundry, which is a, a great restaurant out in California, no masks, no social distancing. I saw the video earlier this year. There was a church service. I, I want to say it was Tennessee, Kentucky, maybe Louisiana. The parishioners, folks, they were in their cars in the parking lot. I mean, you want to talk social distancing. They were in their cars. The pastor was standing out front with a mask on, and the police came, started issuing tickets, and arrested him. See? So, let's make the Sabbath day illegal. Can't go to church. Okay, new moon. Let's take a look at that one. New moon is a symbol of man's obligation to instill holiness into time. The new moons, and we're talking about a Gregorian, we're not talking about the Gregorian calendar, we're talking about a biblical calendar. The new moons establish when the month begins. Okay? So it's the various new moons, we know when the month begins. Well, if we know when the month begins... We also know when the holy days are. Okay? So what are the holy days? The appointed times. The appointed times, 
right? You, you stop what you're doing, you stop everything, and you make your way to Jerusalem, to whether it's the tabernacle, whether it's the temple, we join in a holy convocation and we rejoice together, right? We rejoice, we celebrate, and we remember. We remember history. We remember the Passover. We remember what he did for us and all. And it's a big, it's a celebration. So the calendar, which normally is just a record of material pursuit, right? You go to work, you come home, you go to work, come home, go to work, come home. Weekend. No, no. The calendar is much more than that. The calendar becomes a vehicle. We keep an eye on the calendar. We keep an eye on the new moons because that's when we know, okay, here's when the holy days come. Here's when the appointed times come. We're going to get together. We're going to remember our history. Oh, Mars is not like that. In fact, what they do is they erase history. They tear down statues. They erase history. Oh, gather together? Gather together to serve Israel's God. Well, Antiochus wouldn't do that. Serve God. The gods serve us. So guess what? <laughs> Prohibit new moons. Okay? What have we seen in our country? Not only have we seen the try to at least the erasing of history right because remember if i can erase history i can create my own future okay so you tear down statues you tear down even statues of abraham lincoln who signed the emancipation proclamation can't quite understand that but you tear down that statue anyway you erase history you cancel thanksgiving it's it's not safe we're trying to look out for you. So cancel Thanksgiving. You don't go with your family. You just stay in your home. We'll let you know when it's okay to come out. But you cancel Thanksgiving. Well, no wonder. Marxists don't believe in God. So there is no giving thanks to what? And so what's next on the agenda? Cancel Christmas. I mean, why not? There is no God. There is no Messiah. Just a racing of history. In erasing of holiness. Lastly, circumcision. Circumcision. So what's circumcision? It's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Right? It's where the physical and the spiritual intersect. And it's a restraining mark on the, bo on the body that loudly proclaims, okay, the God of Abraham is my God. The God of Abraham is my God, and now he is my master. He's my master. Not only that, it marks that his son was born of a virgin without any male intervention whatsoever. And so the circumcision becomes a mark of not only my servitude to the God of Abraham, but I am eternally grateful for his son and the virgin birth. Mm. Well, Antiochus wouldn't go for that either. To the Greeks, the human body, the human body was not created to serve. The human body was created to be served. It's all about satisfying the flesh, your desires, whatever you want, whatever you want to eat, whatever you want to drink sexual pleasures and on and on you feed the body the body doesn't serve anything wow it's your body see you do with your body as you please so ladies what are you being told it's your body if you want an abortion that's your body it's not if there isn't any kind of life form inside it's your body you can do whatever you want with it Homosexuality, you can do anything you want. Transgenderism. Transgenderism. Where now it's coming down the pike. Where at this point it's 13-year-olds. They want to make it younger. 
But at, th at this point, it's 13 year old. If 13 year olds go to school and say, and a boy says, you know, I feel like a girl, the school will now give that child hormone pills without the parent's consent in America. See, because you can do anything you want with your body. Well, Antiochus, no, no. The body is regulated. The body is regulated by God and what God's word has to say about the body. Mm. So Antiochus abolished circumcision. So what's the end result of these three, right? You, got, you knocked out Sabbath, new moons, and circumcision. What's the end result? Sabbath, new moons, circumcision. What are you left with? A world without a creator, a calendar without history or holiness, and a body without restraint. It's an old playbook. Satan's doing the very same thing now as he did then. I call it the Greek reset. The Greek reset. We're going to change the world. That's what, that's what Alexander wanted to do. We're going to change the world. We're going to make this thing one world. One world. Not many nations. One world. One way of life. One culture. The Great Reset. One world. One way of life. One culture. An elimination of God off of this planet. What a brilliant idea the Greeks came up with. It almost worked. They almost got done exactly what they wanted to do. But Daniel 11.33 says, And those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. See, the God-fearing people who didn't become the Hellenists, the God-fearing people who knew God and knew his word and revered God, they knew what the Greeks were trying to do. And they said, no, 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 no. We know what you're doing. You're trying to change us. You're trying to get us to deny our God, to, to extinguish our allegiance to him. They saw what was happening. They wouldn't take it lying down. And many of those people died because they refused to be changed. You're not going to change me. You're not going to change me. The Greeks would have got it done. They would have got it done. But a great miracle happened there. A tiny little group of people called the Maccabees. They saw what was happening and they said, no. We're not going to take this lying down. We refuse to offer uh, profane sacrifices. We refuse to have you change us. No. They killed the king's agents. They ran off to the mountain. And they clearly said, we are not going to disappear into the pages of history. No. We're going to take a stand. They planned a revolt. And God honored it. And God empowered them. And in his sovereign will and in his sovereign way, they chipped away. And they chipped away. And they chipped away at this Grecian onslaught. And God gave the victory to the children of Shem. In his power, in his might, against overwhelming odds, they defeated the foes of God's Torah. They defeated them. It was the 25th day on the month of Kislev when Antiochus first slaughtered that swine on that altar. 25th of Kislev. Three years to the day the Maccabees got in there, cleansed the temple. Cleansed the temple. They reinstated the daily burnt offerings. They dedicated 
the temple to the Lord. They cleansed it and they rededicated it because they took a stand. So in closing, we celebrate Hanukkah. We celebrate the Feast of Dedication. And I will admit to you, knowing this story and seeing what's going on in our own country, this Hanukkah feels very, there's something much more to it this time, unlike anything ever before. A great miracle happened there. Indeed, you're going to hear the stories, a very popular story. They found the flask of oil. It lasted for eight days. If you want to believe that, go ahead. I don't. I believe that the great miracle, the great miracle that happened there was that God used a small group of people that took a stand. They faced overwhelming odds and he took that small group, he took this little rebellion, and he gave them the victory. He gave them the victory. The United States, it's morally deceased. Morally, we're deceased. Due in large part, there I say completely, to the ineffectiveness of born-again believers. We've been called upon, Yeshua said it 2,000 years ago, be salt. Be salt. You're the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Salt prevents the decay. The problems that we have here, and we're, just, we're not the only country, mind you. This poison is finding its way throughout all the nations, okay? It's so dramatic here though. It's happening so quickly here. It's because believers just haven't been salt. We haven't been the salt. We haven't stopped the decay. Am I concerned? Yes, of course. America is changing. America is changing. And God is allowing it to change. He's still on the throne. Nothing slips by him. Nothing is being done without his approval. And America is changing. But at some point, at some point, I don't know when, but at some point, the salt is going to have to stand up. Salt's going to have to stand up. And the salt is going to have to say the very same thing that the Maccabees did 2,000 years ago. We're not going away, and you will not change us. You're not going to take away our Bibles. You're not going to close up our churches. You're not going to take away our worship. No, we're going to take a stand. At some point, we're going to have to take a stand. Does that mean... Our victory is going to look like the Maccabean victory. No. No. But God will credit us with the very same victory for no other reason because we took a stand. We took a stand for his name. And we said, no, we're just not going to go silently into the night. Hanukkah. Every night we get together, we light the candles, and we remember it is a memorial. It's a wonderful, wonderful celebration. The children of Shem got the victory. By the power of Almighty God, Israel got the victory against overwhelming odds. And that should always be a reminder to us. Light always shines in darkness. Always. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we trust in you. Our trust is not in a government. Our trust is not in a vaccine. Our trust is not in a system. Our trust is in you. Lord, I, I, I wish what I'm seeing was not real. But unfortunately, it is. 
but I know who's on the throne. You are on the throne. We praise you. We give you the glory. We give you the, the glory. I, my prayer, Lord, is us just sitting here and we're listening to this message. Others are going to be watching it perhaps on video, what have you. Oh, I, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage. You would give us the stamina and the boldness in the face of what is happening as wicked, evil people. <laughs> it seems like it's coming from all over. In the face of all of that, we stand up and we say, no. No, you will not, you will not take away our Bibles from us. And you will not take away our church buildings from us. And you will not take away our worship from us. No. We refuse to go into the night. We refuse to assimilate with you. We're going to take a stand for our God. Lord, I pray that you would give us that boldness. That strength to do that. At the end of it all, we're going to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. Because you are the one that is worthy of it and not us. In Yeshua's name, we come to you, Lord, thanking you for this Hanukkah celebration. Amen.